about Sully, heroes, and angels in the sky. I watched the movie Sully yesterday um, and I was really moved by it. For sure an Oscar winning uh, movie, definitely starring um, my all-time favorite Tom Hanks as favorite to many uh, people. I was actually thankful at the end of the movie that Tom Hanks um, exists because he's such a, an amazing uh, actor. It's like a sure thing. Tom Hanks plays in a movie, you know, it's going to be a, a good one. So uh, basically, Sully is uh, based on the true story of Captain Sullenberger, Berger, sorry about that, who uh, saved 155 passengers by um, basically landing on the Hudson River. Um, it's the story of U.S. Uh, Airways Flight 1549. Very moving, very touching, and um, I teared up a lot. Um, there's laughter, you cry, you laugh, there's drama, there's everything. Basically, uh, the typical winning uh, kind of movie that gets talked about and, uh, and that everybody wants to see. So, at the end of the movie, I was really thinking about why is it that we get so emotional on these stories of heroism? because that's what the movie is truly about, uh, heroes. And uh, I started thinking about uh, the history of humankind, and I think that we're drawn to stories of heroism because, as uh, Sam would tell um, in uh, the, the Lord of the Rings, maybe because we want to believe that, um, that humans are good, profoundly good and that we want to do good for others. And I think that when we see heroes in movies, we, uh, or in theater from the ancient times up to today, we're seeking this heroism and it moves something deep within us. I think it goes really to our cellular memory of something that is bigger than us, that is higher than us. And I think it calls in us our source of being somehow angels to others with angel qualities such as being bigger than oneself such as being able to remain calm and and have this beautiful sense of leadership to help and rescue others to have this kindness and generosity and forgetting about oneself in order to help others to have this kind of being a, a knight right? Being a hero. And uh, so I was really thinking that maybe the movies are there, this kind of movie in particular, are there to remind us of who we can really be uh, as humans, that we can be heroes uh, in our everyday life. Just if we take the time to ponder about our actions when they, they come to be. That being said, I also, um, it also reminded me of something that happened in my own life. And it's funny because I had completely forgotten about that for many, many years. And it suddenly like, maybe it was, uh, it was like a, a cutter assist for me to, to re remember, like an electric shock for me to remember things that I had forgotten or tried to forget, some kind of... Uh, past um, trauma. So I want to share it with you because it's, it's a part of my life that very little people know about. Uh, a lot of people know me as a best-selling author, as an international coach, as a public speaker, now as a screenwriter, um, award-winning screenwriter, should I say. Uh, but very little people know a part of my life that was for a very short time um, in the history of humankind, uh, that was me being a flight attendant, believe it or not. So uh, there was a time in my life where my brother uh, told me that Air Canada was actually opening their doors for a very limited time to people who wanted to become flight attendants. It had been, I think, 20 years that they didn't accept any new applications so when they did open their doors throughout uh, Canada, there were, uh, I think there was something like 150 
or 120,000 applicants. It was huge. There were tens of thousands of people everywhere in every city trying to get in. And uh, or maybe, maybe less. I don't want to exaggerate, but I remember it was a huge number. And they were going to accept only 150 people. So I applied. It was very difficult. You had to go through like four or five different interviews and they were pushing you and trying to see if you can remain calm in any situation and looking at your background and looking at your psychology and you had to do many, many different tests in order to be accepted in their training program, which was a very intensive two months program uh, where you had to basically learn everything about every aircraft and uh, my hat goes to to all the flight attendants out there because uh, every time we go into a plane we really give our lives in the hands of these people and often enough we forget and I see some people that treat flight attendants with much disrespect and I'm always thinking you don't know that your basically your life is in their hands we give our life in the hands of the pilot and the flight attendants, right? So uh, it's a very, very difficult uh, learning. It's uh, nine hours a day, two months, nonstop. Every single thing you do is, uh, is checked and noted. And if you do one thing wrong, you can be out of there in no time. Even a, a bobby pin in the, air, in the hair that's misplaced can get you out of the, the training program. So basically, I was number 151, so I did make it. <laughs> but the 150th person decided to uh, not accept, and I ended up being a number 150, so I got into the program, which was quite unreal, and I was very excited because I love flying, I love planes, I love traveling. Um, so it was for me something, I love even airplane food that's much uh, but it was it was kind of the real airplane food the, the real airplane food if there is any real airplane food at all uh, in those days uh, so anyway I loved the, I, I loved the whole thing I was like really passionate about it so I went through the two months program and I remember very well um, the day we I think it was a two-day um, two-day course on water landing and I remember it very well because I told um, everyone at the class I was kind of a clown if people know me they know I like to make a lot of jokes and I like to to uh, to laugh a lot so uh, and not take myself too seriously so basically during the the class I was telling everyone I don't know why we're wasting our time with these two two days of our lives studying uh, landing on water since we know we all know that if we ever land on the water nobody's gonna ever survive so I was wrong since evidently later on we have Sully who successfully landed a plane on water which is something like out of this world impossible so my story is this I finished my class and I'm accepted to go to uh, fly my first flight which is the flight where they give you your wings the official wings with your name on it and all of that so it's a very exciting first uh, flight and you're very nervous so I get on uh, board uh, we're, we're flying from Montreal to Vancouver I was very excited because it was a long flight I didn't want to do like a Montreal Toronto or Montreal Ottawa which was like an hour or two flight which is very stressful because you don't have time to do much. You just, just as the plane gets off in the air, you have to serve everybody and then pick everything up and rush, rush, rush. Whereas a five, five and a half uh, hour flight, well, you get to enjoy flying. So I was very, very excited. So we get to Vancouver, no problem. And now we have to turn around and go back to Montreal. So we're waiting basically <clears throat> for everybody to get on board for the, the cleaning crew to clean the plane everything's going well except for one thing the pilot and the co-pilot come in they they get into their the cockpit and they go through the review like you see in Sully you have to review everything before you you get to 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 take off 
So they're reviewing everything and they have a little problem, a slight problem with a little light that keeps on flashing. And it's a door that keeps on saying that it's, a, it's open. It's the front door to the right of the aircraft who keeps on, it's a 767 uh, Boeing, and it keeps on saying that it's, 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 it's open, where, whereas the door is closed. Well, everybody's already seated, and it's been a while, and this is keep on going because the, the pilot does not want to sign the log to say that everything is fine because of that light. So the maintenance crew comes on board, they check the door, they check the light, etc., etc., and they finally tell the pilot that everything is fine, people are getting really annoyed, they're starting to be very, very anxious, we, we're getting delayed, it's already been 45 minutes, an hour, we're sitting there and it's getting really uh, too long. So pressure on the pilot to sign the log, and it's his responsibility, he's taking into air a hundred a few hundred people so of course you need to be certain of what you're doing so finally he signs the log because uh, the maintenance crew says that the problem is with the light not with the door and that the door is definitely closed so we fly off we take off and as you see in Sully uh, when there is a um, a uh, a crash landing you have to give these orders you know brace 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 uh, bend your head brace 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 then there's other orders like take off your shoes put on your life jacket there's a lot of different orders that you need to know by heart in your head all the time just in case there would be an emergency landing so usually when you take off you repeat those commands in your head and you repeat all the security procedures of the aircraft you're in just in case something would happen that it's fresh in your head. Before you even go on the plane, you have to restudy what aircraft you're on to know all the procedures as just even a first time um, flight attendant. So basically the plane is in the air and now we start to serve passengers with beverages. So I pull out my cart and I, I remember very clearly I put out um, a can just in front of one passengers and I feel this hand on my shoulder and as I felt it I felt the anxiety attached to the hand and in my mind I thought oh my god there is a problem so all I hear in my ear is secure the cart and get to the front so I know there is a problem so I go and I go and this, this is a true story and I, I, I can't believe I forgot it I just remembered it last night so uh, I go and secure the cart, walk, uh, walk to the front, and now you have to be smiling and very calm and very like nothing is happening, everything is fine. As I walk to the front, I pass by the, the first class passengers, and as I enter right the, the galley where you serve all the drinks and the food in the first class, as I enter, as I pass the curtains, I see one of the flight attendants who's actually holding down the, the handle of the door of the plane. And what I can see from her hands is that they are starting, their veins are starting to pop because probably of the pressure. And she's terrified in her face. And she says that as she was starting to serve coffee, the handle just opened by its, the latch, the handle just popped by itself and she jumped on it to close it so the door would not open in midair. As you know, it could have meant catastrophe for the airplane, but now she's the only one holding the door. Nobody can take it because the pressure is so high on it that if we would, were to exchange hands, we might lose, lose the door. So she's there risking her life so that the door does not open and now what do we do? So uh, the, head, the, the head of the flight attendants tells us that evidently we're going back to Vancouver. We haven't been in flying for, we've been flying for like 45 minutes. So we're nowhere near any other landing area and we have must return, which means another 45, 30, 45 minutes in the air with this lady uh, literally busting her veins to keep us um, to keep us alive, 
So uh, now we just have to, there's a signal, uh, the, the captain evidently goes, this is your captain speaking. We have a minor technical problem. We will have to return to Vancouver. So people start being very upset, very angry. So now we, our job is just to calm everybody down when we are in total freaking panic because we know what's happening. And I remember clearly going to first class and asking everybody to buckle their seat, seat belt and, you know, be, um, be at their seat and, and, and be quiet and be calm, you know. And then there's this guy with his cell phone and he's like really pale in the face and he's talking on the cell phone. And so I asked him, I said, please, you know, can you close your cell phone because we'll be, uh, we'll have to turn around those cell phones allowed. And he looks at me and he says, wow, you're a great actress. Uh, because he says, I'm actually um, part of the uh, maintenance management team. And I'm actually talking to the uh, tower, Vancouver Tower. And we are actually in deep shit. <laughs> I remember those words clearly. And I'm like, no matter what we are, sir, you need to close to turn off your phone and buckle your seatbelt. So basically... Now we're turned around, we're about to, to land. The only big problem we had was that we, uh, our, our wings were full of fuel. We had five hours to fly and the, 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 the fuel is usually uh, into the wings. And the problem with that is that the wings, because they're full of fuel, they're not made to land. Uh, wings usually bend a little because of the fuel in them. So when you land the plane, there's always a possibility of a spark because one of the wings might touch the ground and evidently if there's a spark on the wing, we all blow up. So that's a very, very serious concern. We could not dump the fuel anywhere because there were no areas where you're allowed to dump fuel around Vancouver. There are some areas where that is allowed, whether you like it or not. Uh, just as passenger safety. So basically there's this woman who cannot sit down and buckle her seatbelt because she's the hero of the story. She's basically holding this door down. We're buckled up. <clears throat> and I remember sitting next to the uh, head of the, um, of the flight attendants right next to me who probably felt really sorry for me because it was my first flight. And um, we looked at each other and we said goodbye. It's really a strange feeling, you know? And then you start thinking about all the people you love. I hope I don't tear up with this. All the people you love and all the things you haven't done. All the things you missed out on. All the things you were passionate about and that you didn't you didn't pursue all your dreams that are gone, all the people that you were mean to. You start thinking about all the things you, you're, you're going to miss, the people, the love. And um, it's a very weird sensation to say goodbye. So at the same time, as you're saying goodbye, you're, we were practicing our commands because we're just waiting for the pilot to say brace for impact so that we can start the commands to the people. Evidently, I'm here. Uh, when we landed, the maintenance crew evidently relieved, and not only the maintenance crew, but the ambulance relieved this poor lady from her suffering. Her, her arms were completely black as the veins had literally popped everywhere. It was quite uh, horrible to see. We could, I could see from, from her elbows down. It was really, really uh, ugly. And, um, and that story became, uh, that, that experience became uh, something that they, they taught later on at the Pilot Academy uh, of um, the, the Air Canada training facility for pilots uh, because it was something that's, that's also very unusual. And I remember one of the maintenance guys that saw me uh, I was very young then and, and very inexperienced and very naive and very shocked. And he looked at me and he laughed and he said, oh my goodness, you're not even yet a flight attendant and already you lived through this. 
And he said, do you know wh which plane this is? And I said, well, it's a 767, whatever. And he said, no, no, this is actually a plane that uh, crashed in, uh, in Edmonton, I believe, if I recollect correctly. And there's even a movie that had been made about this plane, but we fixed it up and we glued it all back together. And that's the plane that you, uh, that you were on. So imagine the shock. I didn't know that even was, uh, was done. So uh, basically the flight attendants left and, uh, and the new crew came on board and they asked me if I had the choice to either leave or stay with the flight to come back to Montreal. And I decided to stay on that flight, coming back the same plane. I just believe that bad luck cannot happen twice on the same aircraft. So I, I flew back. The door was fixed. Oh, actually, no, they changed flight. I'm sorry, they changed planes. But the stewardess didn't want to, uh, to stay. And we had the, the, the chance either to stay or, or leave. And I basically, actually now I don't remember if it was the same plane or not. But I remember I went back. So that's my own personal little story of, um, of plane disasters. I... Why I'm telling you this is the third part of this is that I believe that there's angels in the sky. Angels in disguise, angels in the sky. I believe sometimes these little or big fellas come to rescue us. Um, not always. Maybe they know better why it happens sometimes and not others. I believe that that day, that particular day I was on that flight, Angels were there. Maybe that lady was an angel in disguise. She definitely was a hero. She saved our lives. And Sully probably had angels in the sky. So um, thank you for sharing or commenting if you, if you feel like it about this video. Uh, smart move for Sully to come out on this uh, weekend, September 9th to 11th commemorating September 11th disaster of another type of plane crash, which we will all remember that, uh, that led us to a different kind of seeing the world, a different kind of international politics. So um, I hope you go see it. It's, I, I felt it was really good. Maybe share what you thought of that movie or of my story. Um, and, um, and hopefully you'll see one of my movies very shortly on film, on feature film. Thank you so much. Have a blessed day and may the angels be with you.